Okay, we're ready to uh, look then in Acts chapter 7, and we mentioned last, last time Stephen's giving his defense. He's been charged with speaking against Moses and the law, and they've falsely accused him of speaking against the temple, speaking against God, and uh, here he gives his defense and shows that in Israel's history, <laughs> up to this very day that he's speaking, that it's Israel that I and time again did not show respect to God's messengers and uh, uh, that God has always uh, dwelled in different places with His people. He's not limited to the tabernacle or the temple. And to speak about the temple's destruction, you can certainly imply that you're not speaking against God because God has been with uh, Abraham and Ur. <laughs> In, Han in Haran and in the land of Palestine and Egypt and back. God is with us wherever uh, we're serving Him. We can have fellowship with Him. And He was with Joseph. He was with Joseph down into the land of Egypt when his brother sold him into slavery we studied last time. He was a messenger of God that was given dreams, was sent to deliver His people, but he was rejected by his brothers. But Finally, in the end, through God's working, uh, the brothers came down to Egypt and they accepted him the second time and bowed to him just like the dream said. So we can see from the very beginning this story that's happening with uh, the way they're treating the gospel and Jesus Christ has been played out over and over throughout Bible history. That God's messengers have come, Jesus Christ has come, the people rejected him and crucified him. And he's coming back again, though, and he's going to be <laughs> the one everybody bows to, right? So he, uh, that's sort of a theme that's in the background of all of these stories that uh, Stephen is, is given to them. It's not Stephen and the Christians that are rejecting God. It's those that are rejecting Christ. Um, so after looking at the case of Joseph, then we move on to the case of Moses. And uh, so he starts in verse 17, the case of Moses... Uh, in the wilderness, Moses is a divine chosen deliverer, just like Jesus Christ. He, he foreshadows Christ. Verse 17, but, at that, at, uh, but as the time of the promise was approaching, which God had assured to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt until there arose another king over Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph. So Joseph... Uh, well, you know, made sure everybody got enough food and he uh, wisely administered the land. But then another dynasty came in to Egypt. And at that time, he, the, the new Pharaoh didn't know anything about Joseph. He just looked at the Israelite people as uh, a threat, as a bunch of foreigners that are multiplying in the land. They might join themselves to people outside the land, we're told there in the book of Exodus. And so he knew he needed to do something about the Israelites, he thought. And so he made their lives bitter in mortar and brick and work and building all of these buildings and things. For uh, Pharaoh, he enslaved the people and made them slaves. Um, it's thought that there was a new uh, dynasty that, of, of native Egyptians maybe that took over from a former regime that was in charge of Egypt. And... Uh, Again, he didn't know anything about uh, the prominence of Joseph. And this king uh, again came in and was uh, re sometime before Moses was born. This new, new regime took over. Um, some people say it was Thut Moses I in 1539. But something that, you know, just to be aware of, that there's the old chronology or the one they've used for years about Egypt and when all these different pharaohs lived and so on. And then there's a new chronology that a lot of scholars point to where some of these pharaohs in the list probably overlapped with each other and it doesn't go back as far as they, uh, uh, the traditional idea. And really with the new one, there's a lot of things that line up better with the Exodus. But that's a whole complicated <laughs> Thing you know about, we base our history on a list of pharaohs that some Greek wrote down many, many years after those people lived. And uh, so there's a lot about some of this ancient timetable that we don't know whether it's right or not <laughs> when it comes to how long, you know, how far back some of these Egyptian rulers were. 
But you know how it is with these uh, when they put out a program on TV or whatever? They don't tell you about any of the problems. They just tell you their version of <laughs> how everything evolved or whatever or history went. But it's just a lot much more complicated than, than we realize. A lot of study left to be done about who was reigning when and all of that kind of thing in Egypt. So anyhow, we have a new Pharaoh and things have changed uh, as uh, Stephen is rehearsing the story of Israel. And it was he, this Moses, uh, this Pharaoh, who took shrewd advantage of our race and mistreated our fathers so that they would expose their infants and they would not survive. And it was at this time that Moses was born, and he was lovely in the sight of God and was nurtured three months in his father's home. So very uh, cunning uh, Pharaoh that uh, took charge over the people and was trying to suppress them, uh, trying to keep them from multiplying, but it didn't work, did it? God was blessing them more than he could uh, try to restrain their growth. They just kept on growing and multiplying. Uh, even though he enslaved them. And he, then he went to the point that he ha had the midwives uh, or were given an order if a, uh, a baby boy is born that they were, not to, they were to kill it, right? And then, but that didn't work because the midwives feared God. And then there was just a general command maybe to the army went out to throw these male children in the Nile when they were born. And by faith, Moses' parents, they saw he was a beautiful child, and if it was done by faith, then there must have been some word from God about this baby. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. They hid Moses. Uh, he was special. And they tried to protect him for three months. You know, as babies grow, they get harder and harder to conceal. <laughs> it's harder and harder to, sh to hide all the diapers and all of that kind of stuff, right? As you get older and older. And by three months, they couldn't hide him anymore. And they put him in this ark at a strategic spot that where Pharaoh's daughter came to bathe. Miriam was left there to watch over him to see what was going to happen. So his parents uh, placed him there. Josephus says those who saw him, he was so uh, beautiful, like uh, Exodus says, that they just gazed, stopped and gazed in admiration that they saw this child when he was... And there are awful cute babies we see in magazines and on TV. And of course, we all think ours are the cutest too, our grandkids and so on. But he really was something beautiful, I guess, that you would see, that you'd just be, wow, what, a, what kind of child is this? And uh, so they put him in that ark in the Nile. And through God's providence, they put him in the right spot. Uh, this... Uh, daughter of Pharaoh came and they, they saw the ark there and, the, and her servants brought her that ark and they opened it and there was the baby Moses crying, this beautiful child. And she determined she was going to raise this child as her own. So here the deliverer is going to be taken care of right in Pharaoh's own house. And after he had been exposed, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and nur uh, nurtured him as her own son and Moses was educated in all of the learning of the Egyptians. And he was a man of power in words and deeds. So we have uh, Joseph describing the life that uh, Moses led during those years of his youth. We know that uh, she needed a, a, a nursemaid for this baby to nurse him. And Miriam ran up. His sister says, I know a woman that could take care of him. And she went and got Moses' own mother and brought her to raise this child. And so he was taught all the things about Egypt and educated in all of the learning of Egypt and raised as a son of Pharaoh. But at the same time, he was learning about who he really came from, <laughs> the Israelite people. He learned about the promises to Abraham and what God was going to do, give them that land <laughs> And all of these blessings for the whole world were going to come through Abraham's seed. So he was learning all of that too. And uh, so he, he got a, an education from two different women there as he was growing up. In Egypt, uh, they studied medicine and mathematics and music and all kinds of things. And he learned all of that. And as he grew up, he became a powerful man. When you look at uh, Josephus' history of the Jewish people, 
Uh, you know, he throws in what's been handed down by word of mouth and tradition from those times of Moses. And they said he was a general in the army, that he defeated the Ethiopians and some other different countries. He was a powerful man in word and deed. So Stephen kind of approves of that, doesn't he? He's got the Holy Spirit. And he says Moses was a big leader and a big powerful person in Egypt before he went out to try to help the Israelites. And it's sort of interesting that when Moses offered up that excuse, he said, Lord, send somebody else because I don't speak well, <laughs> right? And he's, God was angry with him. He said, well, your, your brother Aaron, he talks good. You can, he'll be your prophet and mouthpiece. But you kind of get the idea maybe he could speak a little bit better than he put on because it says here by Stephen that he was powerful in word and deed. So he had a, he wasn't just a complete flop when it came to talking, was he? Um, so sometimes we, you know, exaggerate our, exaggerate our weaknesses when we don't want to do something, maybe. And that's what, evidently, Moses did that, too. Again, anybody have any thoughts or questions? Again, I'm, I know I'm standing in the same place I was preaching in a minute ago, but <laughs> this is a class. And if you want to add something, you want to... Uh, ask a question or make a comment and go right ahead and do it. Okay. It says Moses is, uh, again, he is the chosen deliverer, but yet he gets rejected. You see the theme in the Bible? <laughs> the story of Christ is kind of replayed out over and over before he came. So we shouldn't be so shocked that Jesus was rejected, should we? They rejected Moses, especially chosen deliverer that God has picked out and preserved and he's raised and he's in the right and when he comes to deliver them they say we don't want you to deliver us you're not what we're looking for but when he was approaching the age of 40 it entered his mind to visit his brethren the sons of Israel and when he saw one of them being treated unjustly he defended him and took vengeance for the oppressed by striking down the Egyptian. And he supposed that his brethren understood that God was granting them deliverance through him. But they did not understand. So Moses had the idea, I guess, introduced before he was born to his parents and maybe passed on to him by his mother, <laughs> that you're the deliverer. And he thought everybody else was going to come to understand that, but they didn't understand that. And uh, he came out to visit his people. It's like when you visit the widows and orphans, the same word there, which is you, you come to somebody with a, a, with a desire to help them in their situation, right? You don't just go to say, hi, how you doing? And they're in need of food or clothing and you just leave. Oh, I visited you. No, you visit with the idea of wanting to help that person, right? That he went out, he's going to help his people. That's what he was out there for. And when he got there, he sees this uh, Egyptian striking a Hebrew. Almost gives you the idea maybe he was beating him to death. And he jumps in and kills the Egyptian and uh, buried him in the sand. He didn't think anybody saw what he did. And uh, he was trying to help the oppressed, those that are worn out and overcome and tired, tried by all of their trials and their sufferings they're going through. He had pity for the people and was wanting to see them delivered. And uh, he thought this would all be a signal that he is here to deliver the people. They need to rally to him. He's the general and the big man there in Egypt. That he'd be a certain person to, to come to to get deliverance. Um, but again, he, he didn't, uh, they did not uh, receive him, we're going to see. The Israelites didn't understand and they didn't accept uh, Moses as the plan. In verses 26 to 28, And on the following day he appeared to them as they were fighting together, and he tried to reconcile them in peace, saying, Men, you are brethren. Why do you injure one another? But the one who was injuring his neighbor pushed him away, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? You do not mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday, do you? So that's pretty sad, isn't it? You come, this is the moment, you think. People know I'm here to deliver, and they reject Moses, just like they rejected Joseph. They reject Moses too. Push him away when he tries to intervene and say, you, you brothers shouldn't be fighting each other. 
You know, we got a common enemy, the Egyptians we need to be fighting, right? Why are you fighting each other? He says, you're going to kill me like you did the Egyptian yesterday? You see, they didn't have any uh, gratitude for what he did. They, they, this thing has become known, and the, and the Israelites, so they're not even supporting him. So we know that Moses fled uh, on that day from Pharaoh and went to the land of Midian to live. And uh, I guess he thought, well, that was a flop. <laughs> this whole thing didn't work out. Uh, he's going to spend another 40 years over there in uh, being a shepherd before God calls him to do the work. Makes, always makes me think about the years of preparation that we're putting in. Sometimes we feel like, well, what good am I doing for the cause of God and the church and everything? Well, you may be preparing yourself for something later, right? There's some other big things that are going to happen, some influence you're going to have you don't know about later on. You just keep on being faithful and growing and equipping yourself, and God will use you for His purpose in our, in our day. So... Um, yeah, and they um, don't. They don't accept Moses here. So he goes over to the land of Midian, and at this remark, Moses fled and became an alien in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. So he really summarizes that whole part of Moses' life, doesn't he? In a quick, quick uh, statement, there he went over and he saw those women. Uh, at the well and none of the other shepherds would let them water their animals and he came out and drove those shepherds off and let the women uh, water their sheep and so on and they took them home to their father Jethro who was a high priest of God in Midian, <laughs> the true God. And so there were other people out there serving God besides the Israelites and he went to work as a shepherd for him and he ended up marrying the oldest daughter, Miriam. <laughs> And then raised two sons and worked there as a shepherd all of those years in the wilderness. So he lived over there as an alien in the land of Midian, across the Sinai Peninsula in Midian. And uh, again, uh, by this time, the Pharaoh that had been searching for him or wanted to kill him because he had, you know, uh, struck down that Egyptian, that Pharaoh was dead now. And we know in the land of Egypt, the people, I, I guess you would think now the tyrant's dead that was having us throw our babies in the Nile and all of that. Maybe we'll get some relief, but the next Pharaoh was just as bad. That's pretty sad. And the people cried out to God. They were crying out for deliverance. And we're going to find out God heard them. Uh, those sons, uh, of Midianites, are descendants of Abraham too through uh Abraham's wife Keturah that he married after Sarah died. He had some other children. And so the Midianites came from them. So they're also sons of Abraham, but they're not a part of the promised line that leads to Christ. Uh, many of these uh, people in that family are going to end up joining the Israelites as they go through the wilderness and go into the promised land. Um, they kind of join Israel. Uh, the Israelites, again, they rejected him, and uh, same things happened to Christ. It's going to be the application that Stephen makes in his sermon. Verses 30 and 31, then after those 80 years, after 40 years of being a shepherd in Midian, then he gets the call from God. He was ahead of God's timetable when he tried to deliver them before. It was just, it entered his mind, but it wasn't God's will that it happened that 40 years before. But this time, he's going to get direct call from God to go deliver the people. Verse 30 and 31, And after 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in the flame of a burning thorn bush. And when Moses saw it, he began to marvel at the sight. And as he approached to look more closely, there came the voice of the Lord. So he's out there on the take care of the sheep, he looks up on Mount Sinai and sees a bush burning and the bush does not burn up. And he says, I have to turn aside and see this wonder sight. And he draws near to it and the, 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 what looks like fire, I guess, coming out of it is actually an angel of God is in that bush with that glory. And he is 
you know, speaking for God and uh, speaks to, to Moses. So there was the uh, giving of the law and all was through uh, the work of angels that we find out here from Stephen and from other, other notes in the New Testament that there are angels involved in all of these things. And he's just marveling at this and he gets closer and then he hears God's voice. <laughs> uh, what, what a shock that would have been to hear God speak through this angel to him. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And Moses shook with fear and would not venture to look. But the Lord said to him, Take off the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt, and I have heard their groans, and I have come down to deliver them. Come now, and I will send you to Egypt. So he uh, is being spoken to by the same God that Abraham <laughs> followed and Isaac and Jacob, all of those uh, that received the promise of the promised land and the promise of the coming of Christ through their seed. The same God that was speaking to them was speaking to Moses. Uh, does that sound like somebody that blasphemes God when Stephen tells the story? So when Stephen had great respect for everything God ever said and God ever did, he doesn't disrespect God like these false witnesses are saying about him in court. All of these stories, he shows he respects the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and that spoke to Moses. And Moses uh, had great fear when God spoke to him, and I'm sure we would too. <laughs> Every time you see an angel or God uh, speaking to people, there is this, this intimidation and, and uh, feeling of uh, unworthiness and, and fear that you're standing in the presence of God. And Moses felt the same way. And he tells him, take his sandals off. This is holy ground. You don't wear your dirty sandals, you know, when you're serving God <laughs> was the practice in those days, certainly. And uh, we know in the temple, the priests did not wear shoes in the tabernacle or the temple. You took your shoes off and they, they served and did everything barefoot. And uh, in the east, I guess they have a lot of customs like that where you take your shoes off, you know, when you leave them outside, you don't wear your, your, your shoes. And that was the, that's the way he recognized this is holy ground. Well, is he at the temple in Jerusalem? No. He's on Mount Sinai talking to Moses. So if you say the temple's going to be destroyed, that's not speaking against God, is it? <laughs> because he's, he can be wherever, right? Not just in Jerusalem at the temple. He's down there in uh, Sinai. And so the Lord is aware. He knows what's going on with his people. Of course, that ought to be a comfort to us. It ought to keep us on our toes if we're not doing right because God knows what's going on always. He knows about their cries and their pain and all the sufferings they're going through. He's concerned about that. And in his time, he's going to deliver them. I'm, I'm sure they were all thinking he should have done it a long time ago. But God is working out a plan. And at the right time that God knows, he's going to deliver them through Moses. And we should bear that in mind too. That uh, God's going to answer us in his own good time and we trust him. And now he's ready to act. He's come down to take action. Just like Moses went out to visit his people, now God is coming to visit and help. And uh, he's going to send Moses to do the job. And so this Moses, whom they disowned, do you see the emphasis that he's placing on that? The same Moses they rejected. This Moses whom they disowned, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge is the one whom God sent to be both a ruler and a deliverer with the help of the angel who appeared to him in the thorn bush. So that angel went with him. He was there to assist when he was doing all of those signs and wonders and things in Egypt. There were angels involved in those things. We can't see them with our eye unless God opens our eyes to see them, but they were there. And they, uh, that, that angel was working with him. This man led them out, performing wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. So 
40 years raised in Egypt, 40 years as a shepherd. Now he's going to spend 40 years with these people heading towards the promised land. And during that time, uh, he was a ruler, a military leader and governor over them. And he was a deliverer that God had uh, appointed him to be, a redeemer, a liberator. Can you see the parallel with Jesus that he's going to draw at the end? Jesus says, come, he's appointed to be the ruler. He's appointed to be the Savior. And you rejected Him. You're doing the same thing. I'm not the one that's against the law and against uh, uh, God. It's been the Israelite people in that court He's talking to. They're the ones that condemn Jesus, right? They've been the ones opposing the apostles in the preaching of the gospel. And so He's going to show you're doing the same thing your fathers did in rejecting the leader and redeemer that God sent the Christ. So many different signs done in Egypt. All those ten plagues, they crossed the Red Sea on dry land and then the sea wiped out the Egyptians afterwards. He fed them uh, with the manna in the wilderness those 40 years and with the quail and many signs and wonders that were accomplished. That angel of the Lord went with them and helped them in all those things. Any other th uh, thing anyone wants to add about Moses here? Yeah, he's giving us the condensed version of this story. Verse 37, This is the Moses who said to the sons of Israel, God shall raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. We heard this prophecy before in Peter's second sermon in chapter 3, right at the end of chapter 3. You remember he quoted this He's quoted Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 18. That's a, when you're sharing the gospel with people, that's an important verse to remember where it's at. You can show them that Moses foretold the coming of a new prophet like Moses, a new lawgiver is going to come. He's going to be raised up from the Israelite people for the Israelite people. And he's going to give them a law, a new covenant, just like they got the covenant from Moses Moses said there's another one coming, right? So he looked ahead to Christ. So if you really respect Moses, what would you do? You'd believe in Jesus, right? So who is it, who is it that respects Moses? The high council here that's trying to prosecute Stephen for preaching the gospel? Or is it the apostles and Stephen and others that are teaching the truth about Moses and what Moses said back there? Moses said, when Jesus comes, you should accept him. He prophesied about Jesus. And so he believed the words of Moses. He's no blasphemer of Moses. They're the ones that are opposing Moses. So he's going to raise up a prophet from among you like me. And to him shall be the obedience of the people. And if anybody does not receive that prophet when he comes, he's going to be... Uh, Removed from the people of God. That's what Moses said. So he's, he's setting it up here for his final, final words. Verse 38 says, This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness together with the angel who was speaking to him on Mount Sinai and who was with our fathers. And he received living oracles to pass on to you. So how great was Moses, this one they rejected? Why, he's the one that received the words of the covenant. The, new, uh, the old covenant, the law of Moses, was, was given to the Israelite people on Mount Sinai. And it was given to Moses. So what an exalted ministry he had, even though they first rejected him. Uh, he was with the congregation, it says here in the New American Standard, in the wilderness. It's the word ecclesia that we translate church in all the other places, right? He was with the church in the wilderness. But we're not talking about the church of Christ that Jesus built, right? This is the Old Testament assembly of people that were at Mount Sinai, the Israelite nation. Jesus said, I will build my church. So he hadn't built the church of Christ or the, uh, the church he was going to build that we're in. That's not the same church, right? <laughs> this was the congregation in the wilderness that uh, they were a part of. But it does show it's a called out assembly of people. That's what the word means. And they were assembled there at Mount Sinai at the foot of the mountain when Moses went up. And he received that law with an angel. So 
the angels communicated that to Moses, and it was God's law. And so you had these uh, angels as mediators there handing it down to Moses in giving of the law. It says that also in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 19. So Paul says the same thing, that it was uh, uh, given through angels. And the Hebrew writer says this law was given through angels. Um, again, that's some added, added material you, you don't get when you're reading the book of Exodus, right? So, so Stephen, through, through the Holy Spirit, has given us some extra information about what happened back there. Aren't we thankful he preached this sermon? We got some more info about how it was delivered. And Moses was there with their fathers, and he received those living oracles. Living oracles are the, are the word of God. It's a, an oracle is a message from a God. And he got living oracles that were given to him. These living oracles, uh, this living message, it, it kind of gives you the idea. It's, it's life-giving. It's the, the word of God endures. It's not dead. It's not like when Moses died, that was it. <laughs> The Word lives on, right? It's going to live and it's going to remain until Christ comes back. Not one jot or tittle is going to pass away from that law until all is fulfilled, right? It's a living uh, living Word of God. And so he gets the Ten Commandments and the other laws that you find in Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy that are laid down. And he passed them on then for their good to the Jewish people. So what a ministry he had. But Christ's ministry is even greater, right? That's what Stephen, if he, if he was allowed to finish, <laughs> they're going to kill him before he can do the whole thing. But you can see where he's going. He comes, he gets the, the new covenant and delivers it. And then they reject it. 39 through 41, and our fathers were unwilling to be obedient to him, even though he gets the law from God. They weren't obedient to him, but repudiated him in their hearts and turned back to Egypt. Isn't that what happened? <laughs> he went up on the mountain after the Ten Commandments were spoken, and he's going to get the rest of the law. He's up there for 40 days, and the people in their heart, they turn away from Moses and what he had to say. And they want to get somebody to lead them back to Egypt. That's what was going on. Saying to Aaron, make for us gods who will go before us. For this Moses who led us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what happened to him. Well, he's been gone for six weeks, right? <laughs> and we haven't seen him. I guess maybe they think, oh, is he dead? You know, he's not coming back. We're going back to Egypt. They rejected him and what he said uh, in that, uh, those, uh, uh, that covenant. In their hearts they said, make us a golden calf. So through Aaron, they pressured him into making uh, uh, an idol to go before them to represent God as they went back to Egypt and they made this golden calf. Uh, they gave their earrings and jewelry to Aaron and out came this calf is the way that Aaron described it. Uh, when Moses is sent back down, and then they expressed their joy about it. They rejoiced in the work of their hands, it says. They, they rose up and worshiped and prayed and uh, partied there around this thing when Moses came back on the scene. So they rejected Moses. Again, it's foreshadowing what Stephen's going to show. You are the ones that rejected God's messenger, the Christ, just like your forefathers did Moses. Verses uh, 42 and 43, God rejects Israel because they reject the covenant that God has made with them. But God turned away and delivered them up to serve the host of heaven. As it is written in the book of the prophets, It was not to me that you offered victims and sacrifices forty years in the wilderness, was it, O house of Israel? You also took along the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of the god uh, Rampha, the images which you made to worship them, I also will remove you beyond Babylon. So he's quoting from the book of Amos. He said, Amos said how it was. In the wilderness, God rejected that generation, didn't he? They were going to die in the wilderness. They didn't have faith to go into the promised land. And Amos points out they were worshiping idols the whole time. They were in the wilderness. 
They said, no other God before me is the Ten Commandments, right? No graven image. But they had their little portable images with them they brought from Egypt and they kept them. Uh, many of them were still worshiping these idols even out there and God determined He was going to send them into captivity someday. Beyond Babylon is what we're told in the book of Amos. They were going to go uh, into captivity. So they didn't respect God's word and they were offering their sacrifices. Don't you usually think, well, back there in the days of our forefathers... They were really faithful, <laughs> but that's not how it was, is what, is what we're told here and told in Amos. They, was, they weren't so faithful. Well, we'll come back and get the conclusion of Stephen's sermon and, and uh, his stoning and the scattering of the church probably in the next lesson.